Another very important detailing that needs to be added to the turret is that of the turret mounted smoke grenade launchers. When the Tiger I was first developed, it had external mounted smoke grenades, and these are a staple found on the early production Tiger Ones. The systems work in that there are six preloaded smoke grenade canisters that are located in these cylinders that we have here. These units are electronically fired from the inside of the vehicle and when they detonate surround the vehicle in a cloud of smoke. This concept has been used throughout the Cold War and is even used today on such vehicles as the M1 Abrams as well as the Leopard. In fact, those systems are actually very reminiscent in design and philosophy to these original German ones and not to the reloadable ones which were developed after this production version of the Tiger. Back to the model, the system that you see here is the kit original ArmorTech unit. The ArmorTech system is all comprised out of, C out of steel components. We have laser cut steel brackets that actually hold the canisters. We have two laser cut and pre-bent canister mounts. And then we have the canisters themselves. They are made from CNC steel cylinders and are very decent quality. They are pre-drilled and pre-tapped. Now, these units here can be turned around and improved detail-wise to have to be very respectable and decent resemblance to that of the original units. However, the the owner of the kit supplied a better set of components from the aftermarket source. The aftermarket versions will be the ones that are used on the tank and they are this set that you see here. For the smoke trajectors, the ones that you see here on the table are the sets that were supplied by the company Panzer Technic. The Panzer Technic sets are extremely nicely done and are a complete replacement for the original Armor Tech units. The way the sets came are exactly as you see here on this table. No addition or any sort of mods were made to these pieces. They were simply bagged and were removed from the bag and put on this table here for filming. They came pre-assembled and as for the sets they are extremely exquisitely fabricated. They are a lot larger compared to the armor tech units and apparently are more to scale. The sets contain a bent steel bracket for mounting the, the component to the turret. We have another laser cut steel mount for that of the mounts for the canisters themselves. The canisters are made from turned aluminum and they feature their correct shape. They have little notches cut into them as well as on the back portion here we have the little drainage holes. If I can get into focus. And on the back portion here we have all of the correct fastener location mounts as well as the electronic firing cables and even the little snaps that keep everything in place. Everything that is brass looks to be some kind of a photo etch type assembly and it does feature brass CNC sections for the plugs. The entire unit comes pre-wired like I said before and everything is wrapped in shrink tubing ready for installation to the vehicle. As for mounting these to the armor tech roof that is facilitated by two countersunk fasteners which only get bolted to the top as you don't want to bolt, can have the sides connected to the sides of the turret as keep in mind the entire roof needs to disassemble from the vehicle. These units here are literally perfect as is and will simply be primed and then mounted to the turret's roof. One of the final fittings that needs to have been fabricated and mounted to the turret in order to get it finished off is that of the rear blower that we have here on the back portion of the turret. Now for anyone who has watched the ECA channel in years past and also who have been frequently the ECA catalog, you'll notice that this is not the first time that I've had this component found on the ECA catalog. However, that detail has been around for many years and ha was slightly different in appearance than the one that you see here on this model. That version had an integral cap along with several studs for mounting of fasteners and wing nuts along with a little handle. That version represents that of what the air filter cover would look like when the tank would be going into its snorkeling mode. Like what was mentioned in several of the videos past, the Tiger One, when it was originally designed, was able to have fording capabilities. In order to achieve this, many of the components and air intakes that are found on the top deck as well as on the turret need to have been sealed off to prevent, of course, water from coming in when the tank would be submerged. 
this cover here was no different. And if you see here on the perimeter here of the rim, the unit is not simply just mounted directly to the top deck. In fact, there is a small little gap in between the roof and this rim. This, the reason for this gap is for fasteners to lock into this section here. So when you tighten those wing nuts on the cap, it secures everything in place. Now, that component is only used when the tank would be going through its snorkeling. When the tank would enter into battle, that component would not be present on this build. However, it is a common feature when you see people who model the Tiger One to leave this cover with the snorkeling cap added, which technically is incorrect, specifically when the tank is being modeled for that of a battle scene. Now, the version with the cover cap that was found on the ECA catalog, like I said before, has been around for many years. However, the molds have been worn out, and so that piece has been eliminated off the catalog and has been replaced with the unit that we see here. Now, for this model here, the cap is not present as the tank is not being built with the forwarding capabilities. With the camera off the tripod here, you can see the cap in better detail. If I go low to the roof, you can see the space between the turret roof and the lip of the air intake. Now you can also see the spaces that are left from the top cover and the bottom portion. On the real Tiger One, th this top plate here is actually bolted to the unit with fasteners found on the inside. And then you have these spacers here that keep the top plate at a constant height. All of the details that you see on this component here are integrally molded into the casting and are supplied with the unit. Now the stock Armor Tech kit does supply you with a basic air filter detailing and that is found with these components that I have here. The Armor Tech piece is comprised of three components. You have the bottom base, which is made of CNC aluminum. You have a laser cut steel disc with the little arms in it. And you have another CNC'd aluminum component for that of the top portion. Once all assembled, the unit looks like this. Now as for the Armor Tech unit here, this here is a carryover from the tank's first mid-production release and I believe has basically stayed the same exact shape and design throughout the years and the other Armor Tech releases and re-releases of the Tiger One kit. Moving on from the air filter takes us to the turret roof welds. All of the welds have been added to the turret and have been added in my usual format. The welds run along the rim. You have here this dividing weld that's found on the front of the Tiger One and of course around the commander's copula. Another addition that was made in addition to the weld was done to the loader hatch that we have here. Now this was mentioned earlier and it is actually bolted to the turret roof like what was seen in an earlier scene. Now the because of the way it is fastened there are fasteners that are located on this portion here. Now these fasteners are present on the real tank however unlike the real tank which uses flush mounted tool headless fasteners. On the Tiger One for the 6L Icons kit, they are small little Phillipses. The Phillips heads do detract from the look of the vehicle, so in order to plug them up, I went ahead with the epoxy that I used with the welds and simply plugged up the fastener locations. A similar modification was also done to the bow hatches for the same effect. With the tool heads removed, the component is much greatly improved in detail and looks a lot better. Moving from the loader's hatch takes us to the smoke grenade launchers. The launchers are the ones which were mentioned in the previous scene and on this model here have been mounted directly to the roof of the tank. This is facilitated by two countersunk fasteners which are blended into the bodywork which is found here on the top. Now, because the roof is fully removable, having the component on the real tank is a little problematic in that on the real tank the bracket is welded to the roof and then is also welded to the side here of the turret. Because of the removable roof, this is gonna cause some issues. On the model here, the piece is only making contact with the tank via the roof, and the welds that you see here are purely just for detail. 
Now the same type of features are found on the opposite side and the smoke grenades are a mirror image of each other. Now to take off the roof of the model this is very important as due to the detailing that's found on this piece here if you take it off incorrectly or have a poor hand holding you can cause some damage or lead to some issues. The, best, the way the turret is designed to be removed on this model is all done via the loader's hatch. You first open up the loader's hatch to its full open position and then you put your hand on the inside. Now, the commander's cupola can give you a good grab point. However, the problem is with the interior detailing that was added to the periscopes as well as the headrest, by putting your hand in and getting a hold of it, you can cause damage to those detail components, so it is not recommended to do. To pop the lid, you simply put your hand into the loader's hatch area, and with your thumb, you, let, you rest it against the side portion here of the turret casing. This is going to give you leverage, so when you push down with your thumb, it'll overpower the magnets in order to pop off the, the roof. The other hand can grab onto the commander's top of the drum itself and, and add a support. When it comes time to remove, a, which like I said before, with your thumb, you push down on the side of the turret casing, which will overpower the magnets, opening, opening up the lid, and then the entire turret roof simply just lifts right off. Now with the roof off, you can see that the pieces overhang from the sides of the roof. This can lead to issues specifically when it comes time to placing the roof onto a flat area. Something like a table can cause damage to these parts and you don't want to flip it upside down as the detail on the outside as well as the paint finish can also get damaged or can get messed up with any type of equipment that's on the table. When it comes time to putting the turret on something, I recommend something like a five gallon bucket in which you could just simply place the turret on top. It straddles over the rim of the bucket without making contact with the smoke grenades or even the hatch interior details as we see here that as these loaders hatches have this distinctive horn that comes out, which on the real tank of course is used for the counterweight spring, but that's a subject matter for another video. You can also see how the piece was designed just like with the upper hull. The welds are all present on the lid, which makes the component easier to remove and pop on. And the seam is mitigated due to the way the weld beads were sculpted. To place the component back on, again, hand into the loader's hatch as such. If you notice, I, my other hand grabs onto the commander's copula. And I use the palm of my right hand top of the air ventilator and it acts to level the turret. You simply line up the components and if you notice I go in first with the front portion of the turret into the recess. This locks it in and then the entire turret roof simply just rocks into place. Again the magnets will do the rest in holding it in and which you will hear an audible click and that click tells you that the turret is now fully seated to the turret sides. Now, the viewers of this video series may know that the tank, operationally, is fully active and is basically complete. However, there is one more detail that I've been keeping secret that will be added to this model that is really going to make it kick it up to the next level. And that is contained in this box over here. As for what this box is containing, well, let me open it up and show you all. What this is, is a fully completed animatronic 1-6 scale action figure. The figure is built off of a Dragon 1-6 scale action figure and has been modified where in its torso there are several small micro servos that are concealed. Each of these servos control a certain aspect of this figure's motion. This particular figure was procured and was assembled by a fellow by the name of Vincent Abbott. Vince Abbott is known in the Armor Tech circle and he was very prolific and active in the Armor Tech community in the early to mid 2000s period. During that time he has built several exquisite 1 6 scale models based on the Armor Tech tanks, which many of which are actually found on YouTube. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised that on the right hand video bar on this side you may see one or two of his videos that are up there. In addition for building builds for himself he also released a limited range of detail components as well as animatronic figures like you see here. 
In fact, I believe that Vince was also a part of Panzer Technic, which of course, if you've seen the series of videos, that name has popped up on several occasions. As for his animatronic figures, one thing about Mr. Abbott was that he does work in the film industry, and he would incorporate his techniques in working in the film industry in, namely, puppets and animatronics, and he would incorporate them into his builds. And that's what you see over here. The figure is fully assembled out of the box, and he's also fully wired. As for the setup, in addition to just having this the the figure hooked up to servos, he also went ahead and hooked up to this very interesting computer circuit board. The way you see the figure is exactly how it was shipped, and no mods or any sort of tinkering has been done to this figure at this point here. What's very interesting about this circuit board is that this board here allows you to have the figure run independent on a pre-recorded circuit so that the figure can move around on his own independently. It is controlled by these three knobs and there are several other fittings and switches that can be used to further calibrate the figure's performance. Basically the way it works is that this here will play the track during the programming phase. This red button here records the actual movements and this one here ch chooses which channel you are going to program. This little potentiometer here is what actually uses to control the certain function that you are on. When the piece is hooked up to the 12 volt power supply, when you are programming the piece, you are on a certain LED. One of these LEDs indicates which servo that you are currently operating. The system holds about five minutes of actual animation time inside of the chips. Going deeper into the box takes us to the instructions, which are, which are very li well laid out. And at first, I'm not gonna lie, can be a little bit overwhelming, as it's a lot of verbiage and can be quite technical. However, I must say that the unit was able to be calibrated very quickly and very efficiently, and I was actually surprised on how easy it was to, to fully do. Now, as for the figure's attire, as you can see, the figure is just your average infantryman and is not that of a tanker. Now, because the figure is based off of a Dragon 1-6 scale figure, all of the 1-6 scale Dragon components and garments will fit on this figure with no problems. Now, as for outfitting him further from this point here, that will be left to the customer as he will take the reins and outfit the figure to whichever way he deems fit from this point on. Now, one piece of the figure that was very well thought out in its design is with that of the umbilical cords. As you can see, th there is a lot of wire that is supplied with the piece, which is extremely important because with the figure being mounted inside of the turret, you need to have this long umbilical cord which connects the figure, has to run down through the turret and into the confines of the hull, in which the control box will be located. Now, to really enhance the unit further, the unit will be connected to the tank's 12 volt power outlet that's found on the tank's power supply. And that's facilitated with these two cords that I have here. If we notice, there's also a nice little fitting of that of a fuse, which is found in this section. Now, to have the, com the piece be actually controlled by the radio, I'm going to hook the system up to the RC equipment. And the way I'm gonna do that is with this Electronize remote switcher. Now this system here was actually spare from the original option pack which was supplied with the original tank. Rather than have it sit in a spare parts bin, it's going to be recycled for use to activate the figure so that the operator of the vehicle with a single hit of a switch can control and activate the animatronics on the figure at will or shut them off. And here's the model now with the machinery added to the interior of the hull. And the top deck has been placed on. And if you also notice, I went ahead and began the painting process. As for the paint that you see here, this is my base coat, which I get a lot of questions about this. The color is my own mix that I have mixed in a gallon form, which is definitely important, specifically when building a tank that's 1-6 scale, as little bottles of model paint just are not going to cut it. 
As for the paint that you see here, the reason why I painted this portion now is that once the turret gets fitted to the hull, getting access to this area with an airbrush is going to be very difficult and will normally leave for exposed areas of unpainted model. These recesses are visible, but like I said, are difficult to reach with the airbrush. So at this point now, I take the opportunity to cover my bases. As for the application, this is done with a fan brush, which is nice and soft. And I go ahead and I just simply brush on the paint in a nice smooth format. The advantage of a fan brush is that it reaches a wide area and blends in for nice smooth type brush strokes which are not very visible and once painted over with the overspray of the airbrush blend in seamlessly and you don't have any coarse brush strokes to worry about. The paint is also diluted to give a nice silky smooth appearance as much as possible. Moving our way to the front nose of the vehicle takes us to the front shovel. Now this is one bit of detailing that is a trademark on the early pattern of Tiger 1's. On the early pattern Tiger 1's, on the nose here, we have this large shovel which is present and hard mounted directly to the nose of the vehicle. This is to change on mid and later production units in which this entire bit of kit here was simply omitted and is not present. As for the shovel that you see here, this is actually the stock kit original one that comes with the Armor Tech kit. The stock shovel is very nicely done in that it is the correct shape and size. The white metal casting is nice and clean and does not have any of the scan lines which are typically found on many of these early first generation of Armor Tech pieces which have also been mentioned in other videos. As for the shovel itself it will be modified from this kit original here in which you see it has this long metal handle. This long metal handle here will be amputated and will be replaced with a new one made from a wooden dowel. Now unlike the Pioneer tools which are found on the top deck in which the 6 scale icon components were utilized, for these versions here I didn't have any spare 6 scale icon parts on hand so I need to fabricate new class. The class you see here are fabricated in the same manner that I use on my other personal 1 6 scale German tank builds and are fully functional. They're made of metal and securely lock everything in place. As for the method of which I fabricate these, these are actually modified from jewelry clasps which have a very close resemblance to that of the German tool mount and which is why they are simply modified and used in their place. These pieces here blend in seamlessly with the other 6 scale icon components which are found on the rest of the build. Moving our way to one of the final details that need to have been added to the tank to get it ready for painting is that of the sprocket hubcap detailing. Now because of the way the sprocket is designed on these Armor Tech kits in which you have the sprocket, a taper brush lock, and to install everything is done from the face of the sprocket, because of this design one of the side effects is that you have a large hole to plug up on the face end of the sprocket in order to have the correct pattern of detailing. The stock Armor Tech kit supplies you with two white metal discs that facilitate this purpose and the stock ones are actually pretty decent. They have, they're casted in white metal and installed pretty well and have some adequate face detailing on them. However, on this build here they will not be utilized for the simple reason that the stock original hubs that were supplied with this kit were that of a mid or late production Tiger 1. Which is no surprise, as like I frequently mentioned, the, this is a carryover from when the kit was first released by Armor Tech, in which the first generation Armor Tech Tigers were based off a mid production vehicle. As for these pieces, they will not be utilized, and in their place, I will be replacing them with these two resin hubs that I fabricated here. The two hubs are used on my own builds and are not found on the ECA product line. These pieces here are specifically designed to fit onto the Armor Tech hubs and have their correct pattern of shape as well as their acorn fasteners present. The difference between the old versions and the new versions can be seen in the thumbnail listed below. Now I would have compared my rest of ones with the original Armor Tech ones. Unfortunately, I'm having trouble tracking down the original hubs at the moment, so the thumbnail in the picture should be suffice. 
as you can see, the, the entire face has been redesigned compared to the early and mid or late production units. And the thread pattern of the fasteners is somewhat different in that rather than having this big domed appearance, the later ones were flat and had these special plates which bolted onto the fastener and kept everything locked securely in place. Like I said, rather than using those ones, I would simply swap them out for these rest ones. Now these rest ones that you see here have been primed with a flat black paint and will be added to the, to the sprocket hub as soon as the road test is concluded and I know that everything is on the up and up. And here we have the sprocket just before the mounting of the hub, which will be concluded after the road test, like I just mentioned. Now, one addition that I made to the stock ArmorTech kit is that I went ahead and added a retention washer and a center fastener. The original, these ArmorTech final drive gears have a center hole that is pre-threaded by ArmorTech. Now, if anyone has been a fan of my previous videos, you notice that I typically leave this component alone as it's not necessary for these ArmorTech tanks to have this retention fastener that we have here. If you properly install the sprocket with that of the taper brush lock, the point of this fastener is pretty much moot. Having said that, however, I had these fasteners and these washers on hand and I decided as a why not, as it does give you a little bit of an extra insurance policy, not that it's absolutely required or mandatory. As for the piece, it simply threads on and the washer just braces everything and holds everything firmly together. Now, even with this fastener added, the replacement hubcap still has plenty of space to fit on in its correct manner. Now, what's also interesting to point out is that Panzertechnik actually had a component that facilitated the same purpose. Theirs, however, instead of being a two-piece affair like I have here, was a little bit more engineered and their version was all CNC and I believe out of a single piece of steel that had the washer and the fastener integral and built in. Now as for the model here this was done to both sides of the vehicle as I had enough fasteners on hand and washers on hand to facilitate the procedure. Now as for the fastener itself it is held in place with blue Loctite as opposed to the red Loctite for the simple reason that the the blue Loctite is simply just to keep the fastener in place. However, if I ever, or if the anyone who's operating this tank ever for an emergency case needs to remove it, it the fastener should not put up too much of a fight and the blue Loctite will be overcome by the torque and will prevent the fastener from getting damaged or possibly stripped, which can happen with red Loctite as it is stronger of a medium. Going on to the interior, here we can see the additions that have been made. Here we have the figure control box. This enclosement here is what houses the circuit board for that of the animatronic figure which was mentioned in a previous scene. In addition to that, we also have the sublooms now which are ready for the installation onto the turret. Now as you see on this model here everything has been labeled with that of pre-printed ID labels which will definitely avoid any sort of confusion which can happen by anyone who is servicing the tank and needs to remove and reinstall the turret. Now on the main subloom, you'll notice that this pack of wires here has a label that says dead, and that is because these wires here are not used on this build and are just basically an appendix of sort. So it's on connected to the subloom, and rather than trying to delete them or cut them off, I just simply just tie them together and mark them accordingly to prevent any type of confusion from anyone who's working on this vehicle. The only cord that will be utilized on the main subloom is that for the gun elevation, which I have here. Connected to the subloom is my subloom, which is piggybacking off of it for the ride, and this here has the electronical components for that of the gun, which of course is clearly labeled. This plug here is that of the main power that actually rotates the motor, and this servo plug here connects to the servo which connects to the electronic switcher which gets controlled by the radio and is what actually controls and triggers the system making it function. Another subloom that was added is that for the animatronic figure, which of course it is marked. In addition to marking the subloom, I went ahead and also painted on numbers on the 
servo jacks that have corresponding numbers found on the figure so that everything is hooked up in their proper orientation so the figure will work in the way that I programmed it and showed it earlier. Moving from the turret hatch takes us to the control panel. Like we'll showcase in an earlier video, underneath the radio operator's hatch is where all of the main functions are controlled. We have the smoke, the fans, the lights, as well as the refueling system. Now in the previous video from a few months back, I said that the pieces were to be marked and as you can see the labels have now been added. The little red dots that you see on the markings is that to indicate in which position the switch is in the on state. The only one that this is not added to is the smoke as it says quite clearly on and in red no less. Well, with the last of these fittings and add-ons completed to the hull, the vehicle is now ready for the mating of its turret. And here's the completed turret now mounted onto the body. The tank at this point here is completed and is ready for painting. However, just before I take it out for painting, of course I'm going to take it for a test drive just to make sure mechanically the drivetrain and the track links are all at the correct tension. And here's the figure temporarily fitted to the turret. Now the figure plugs into the circuitry via the servo connectors which were supplied and mentioned in the previous scenes. Also like what was mentioned in the previous scene, the circuitry for the, for the figure has been patched into the tank's power supply and the figure runs off of the tank's power which means there's no separate batteries at all to worry about in dealing with this model here. There's only the two main cells which are charged by the recharge jack which is mentioned in a much previous earlier video. As for the figure himself, the way you turn him on, he is remotely controlled in that you can turn on and turn off the animations and this is done via this channel here on the radio. By moving this down once this will trigger the animation sequence. And to turn off the animations, you simply go up. When you turn the switch back on, he will resort back to the original first step of the pre-recorded animation sequence, which I programmed earlier. Now, like I said, the figure is only mounted in temporarily. After the filming of the scene, the figure will be removed, disconnected from the plugs that are inside the turret, and the hatch will be closed as the tank will head off into painting, and obviously you don't want to have this guy sticking outside the hatch during the painting procedure. And with that, that concludes this project update video for this vintage Armortech 1-6 scale radio-controlled early production German Tiger 1. If you like this video, stop by and like us on Facebook where there are more photographs of this build that have been posted since the project start, as well as many of the other builds that have been showcased on the YouTube channel as well. In addition to that, don't forget to stop by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks for watching.